Hello everyone, I am Naveen Chakrapani, Director of Product Management at RAFE. What I'll be doing today is walking through best practices for implementing multi-tenancy in Kubernetes environments. A lot of the material that I'll be covering today is based on our experiences working with customers, helping them implement multi-tenancy in their Kubernetes environment. I'll be focusing on two things today. First, I'll provide some insights into why this is an important problem to solve for and also summarize key challenges. Two, I'll cover considerations that platform teams have to think about from an infrastructure standpoint when implementing multi-tenancy uh, in, in Kubernetes environments. From an allocation of compute standpoint, whether it is with dedicated or multi-tenant clusters, there are three important factors that you will have to uh, think about. One is around cost, second is security and governance, and the third is operational overhead. The cost associated with running a multi-tenant uh, cluster infrastructure obviously is much lower compared to dedicated clusters. And this is the reason, top reason why organizations look at a multi-tenant cluster model. From a security and governance standpoint, when it comes to dedicated clusters, because you'll have more number of clusters, it will be more of a challenge in maintaining consistent security controls and governance policies uh, across clusters, because these clusters could be across many different clouds, could be running in your on-prem uh, infrastructure. So it's gonna be quite a challenge making sure that everything across the board is consistent. But for multi-tenant clusters, that there are other nuances that you'll have to think about. As an example, as a best practice, you will have to enforce isolation policies so that a vulnerability in one application does not end up impacting other applications running in the same cluster. The third piece, which is the operational overhead, um, as with security and governance, the more number of clusters you have, the more effort it'll take to, as an example, perform an operation like cluster upgrades. Having said that, there are also nuances with multi-tenant clusters where if a particular application has dependency on certain add-ons or CRDs, so you'll have to resolve those dependencies as well where before performing uh, cluster upgrades. So all these three factors, you'll have to think about the considerations and then uh, it's easier to determine what is the right model for the applications running in your environment. What we've seen uh, customers do uh, to successfully implement uh, a program is standardize. The first step that they do is standardize the process for allocation of compute. Uh, that involves establishing clear guidelines in terms of who gets a dedicated cluster versus a namespace. What, we, what we've seen organizations do is lock down on namespace or a set of namespaces as a default model for allocation of compute when application teams request for it and only allocate dedicated clusters when there's a strong reason, when it satisfies one of the considerations that they have laid out as, as necessary for a dedicated cluster to be allocated. Some of the typical reasons that we've seen organizations allocated dedicated cluster for are summarized in the slide. As an example, an application may have low latency requirements, uh, means that the target SLA or SLO is significantly different from others. Or the application could be internet facing and it generates a lot of traffic and you don't wanna be running multiple applications on the same cluster uh, in this instance. They could also be specific compliance requirements 
or the application could have specific requirements that are unique to it. As an example, an application may require GPU worker nodes. So these are some of the reasons that we've seen customers allocated, allocate dedicated clusters for. Uh, depending on the applications that you have, you may narrow down on one, of the, one or more of these considerations when deciding whether a dedicated cluster is, 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 a, is the ideal compute for an application. And there are three important things that platform teams uh, start with when implementing multi-tenancy in Kubernetes environments. First is controlled access. And controlled access includes RBAC enforcement, IDP integration, and secure access to Kube API servers. The second one is taking care of noisy neighbor issues. So this involves having resource quotas for applications and also implementing isolation policies via network policies. The third one is insights, gaining insights into resource utilization. This is important for any right sizing exercises. And also if you're gonna be implementing a chargeback or showback model, uh, this is absolutely uh, required. And remember that you'll have to do this at scale across the many clusters that you have. And these clusters could be running in AWS or Azure or your on-premise uh, data centers. Let's take the first one, uh, control access. And let's consider just the RBAC and IDP integration pieces to begin with. On the left-hand side, you see the IDP piece. So ideally, what you would want to do is integrate with the identity provider that you already are using in your environment to drive authentication and authorization so that it is consistent with the other tooling uh, that you have. The other piece is the RBAC piece, cluster role binding and role binding uh, aspects, considerations uh, from a Kubernetes cluster standpoint. The key thing is how do you wire these two uh, together? And when doing so, you also have different kinds of use cases uh, that you may have to enable. As an example, you may have uh, users or developers who need both read and write access to namespaces where their applications are deployed in a test cluster. But when it comes to a production cluster, so you may want to only grant read access uh, to the namespaces in which their applications run. Or you as platform administrators, you'd want to have cluster-wide access uh, across all clusters. So this is an important a uh, problem to solve for. And, and without this, uh, you'll not be able to uh, implement a secure multi-tenant model. The third piece in the control access consideration is, is secure access. When I say secure access, it, it means secure access to Kube API servers. Your users could be anywhere. They could be working out of a cafe and how do you make sure that they can access uh, Kube API servers securely? And there are expensive solutions out there like a VPN or a Bastion jump host model, but these do not uh, scale uh, very well. And this is one of the key reasons why we open source one of the capabilities within our platform. Uh, the open source offering is called Palace. Uh, and all that you have to do with the architecture that Palace enables is uh, allow outbound 443. And uh, if you have this use case, please try it out. You're, we are constantly trying to uh, make the solution better. Uh, your feedback will be uh, much appreciated. So to summarize, from a control access standpoint, there are key, three key things that you have to think about. IDP integration implementing Kubernetes RBAC, and then secure access to Kube API servers. The second key consideration after control access is noisy neighbor issues. And this has two parts. The first part is resource quotas. When thinking about resource quotas, 
the first step is determining how you want to enable namespace as a service. Are you going to create namespaces on behalf of application teams as in when they request it? Or are you going to enable a self-service model for application teams so that they can create their own uh, namespaces? If it's the latter, you will have to think about additional policies uh, that you may want to enforce so that the application teams do not end up consuming too much of the resources that are available in the cluster. It's important to have resource quotas set and the necessary guardrails uh, to make sure that applications only consume uh, as much as they need and they don't aff start affecting uh, other applications running on the same cluster. The second piece is implementing network policies. By default, namespaces in Kubernetes clusters are not automatically isolated. So what this means is uh, you will have to implement the necessary network policies uh, to ensure that if there's a vulnerability in one of the applications, the lateral uh, attack surface area is contained and it doesn't end up impacting other applications running on the cluster. The typical process that we've seen uh, organizations take for this is to so start with default deny and then start implementing the standard policies. And this typically is allowing traffic between namespaces belonging to the same application and allowing name traffic from namespaces uh, belonging to an application to what is construed as system namespaces. So these system namespaces are namespaces where you could be running your security tooling, monitoring tooling, uh, and so on. All other traffic patterns uh, typically is, is still not uh, allowed. So once you've configured the policies, uh, the next step is configuring exceptions if there is a need. Uh, it could be that uh, a particular piece of an application needs to communicate with uh, another uh, application. So you would want to uh, allow traffic between those two namespaces. And then the last step is just tuning and validating policies, making sure that everything's working as appropriate and investigating uh, traffic flows. For example, if a specific pattern that you've blocked, uh, there, is, there are a lot of uh, traffic hits against that. You may want to see what the reason is. The third key consideration is tracking resource utilization to carry out cost optimization exercises. So when you have a multi-tenant cluster, it is imperative that you collect granular resource utilization metrics. Uh, for this purpose, you need a cost tooling that's tailored for Kubernetes uh, environments. And typically what we've seen organizations do is, is first determine how they want to collect metrics in a consistent manner uh, across clusters, whether they're running uh, in one of the clouds or running uh, on-premise. So once uh, they've done that, the next step is figuring out how you're going to organize resources belonging to various teams or applications, implementing a chargeback or showback kind of a model. Typically what we've seen customers do is use namespace labels or cluster labels for this purpose. And you can use the same labels that you use for uh, non-Kubernetes uh, resources so that they're consistent across the board. The third piece is unallocated resources and common services. Ultimately, the numbers need to add up so you need to figure out a way to allocate either resources uh, that are not being used or resources that are common services. Uh, example again is security tooling and monitoring tooling. Uh, you have to figure out a way to allocate these costs and you can do it either proportionately or equally among the different teams or applications using the cluster. And the last piece is visibility. And this is super important uh, because without providing access to cost metrics to the various stakeholders, including the application teams, you're not gonna be able to carry out any cost uh, optimization exercises in an efficient uh, manner. So to summarize, it's important to track and build uh, internal teams or applications to gain visibility into cost structure. 
And then in order to carry out cost optimizations in an effective manner, you need to provide a self-service model where application teams have access to cost metrics for their resources. Before I end the session, here's a brief overview of RAFE systems. RAFE is an operations platform that helps customers scale their Kubernetes footprint in a consistent manner, maintaining the necessary guardrails. There are a number of services that are available uh, within the platform. All of the key considerations that I spoke about uh, from a multi-tenancy standpoint are available as inbuilt capabilities uh, within this platform. Hope this session was useful. Thanks for attending. Thanks for making the time to attend this session. Thank you.